What a treat we have this morning. We're going to start out, um, I guess, with a little film clip, a conversation um, between Catherine and Shelley, and then there will be some opportunity for questions from, from you all. So let's welcome our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as David mentioned, we're going to start out with a film clip this morning. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming out early on a Saturday morning. It is a beautiful Saturday. I know I'm very excited to be here. I, I saw the movie Hidden Figures when it came out, and I loved it. It's inspiring. And I'm so grateful for people like your grandmother. And uh, we'll take a moment and take a look at this video about Katherine Johnson. In her own words, yes. Man, it's just there. That has always been a part of whatever I was doing. All engine running. You're either right or you're wrong. That I liked about it. They tell me I counted everything. Everybody stood at a big table. And after I finished mine, I helped them get theirs. And I was the youngest. I wound up the head of my brother, maybe two grades. I don't remember how many. <laughs> I entered college, I was 15. And I was gonna be a math teacher, cause that was it. You could be a nurse or a teacher. He said, you'd make a good research mathematician. I said, oh, what do they do? He said, you'll find out. So they had me take all the courses in the catalog. Sometimes I was the only person in the course. I said, where will I find a job? He said, you look till you find it. Took me seven years, but I found it. He said, you're very lucky. Langley has a post for black mathematicians just opened it up to women. They had a pool of women mathematicians. They just wanted somebody to do all the little stuff while they did the thinking. We were called computers, women computers. I had been there less than a week when this engineer came in and wanted two women computers and Mrs. Vaughn sent me over to the flight branch and we never went back. Today, a new moon is in the sky, placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Oh, they felt terrible that here we sat, and the Russians had a vehicle riding around looking down on you. So we set out to send somebody up there and look down, too. They'd call a group of engineers and have a briefing as to what they were going to have to do. And I asked, could I go? They said, women don't ever go to those. I said, is there a law against it? They said, no, we'll let her go ahead. I wanted to know what it was they were looking for. So I wound up doing what it was they were trying to find out. Commander Alan B. Shepard was to become the first man sent into suborbital flight. The Mercury capsule is right on course. Our office computed for every mission that went out at that time the height, the speed, and so on. It became a geometry problem. Right, ignition sequence start. I felt most proud of the success of the Apollo mission. They were going to the moon. I computed the path that would get you there. You determined where you were on Earth when you started out and where the moon would be at a given time. We told them how fast they would be going, and the moon would be there by the time you got there. Beautiful, just beautiful. We were really concerned when they were leaving the moon, going back. He had to do it just as we said. If he missed it by a degree, he doesn't get into orbit. I was looking at the television. I said, boy, I hope he got that right. <laughs> and I was sitting there hoping I'm right, too. <laughs> John Glenn said, tell her. He knew that I was the only woman that worked on it. He said, if she comes up with the same answer that they have, then the computer's right. 
It took me a day and a half to compute what the computer had given him. It turned out to be the exact numbers that they had. It was my job, and I did my job correctly and well. So that was a tremendous video, and as I'm watching it, I am struck by the fact that I did not hear about your grandmother and her contribution to history until I was a woman hmm. in my 40s. I'm struck by that and the tremendous contribution that she had to history yes. in this country. I mean, you've described your grandmother as a humble person. When did you find out the huge contribution that she made to the history? The huge contribution. I knew as a child that she, did, that she was just a, a special person. And I always have said that my grandmother is the most special, the most She's the best human being I've ever met. Whether she was my grandmother or not, just to be in her presence, you know that there's something uh, different about her in a very, very good way. Um, but as far as when did I know about her huge contribution, knowing that she worked at NASA, having gone to her office, had lunch, bar mitzvahs, um, the flight days when they would invite the families out to certain uh, NASA events, I knew that her job was important. I knew that she was the only black woman in the room. But I still did not know about her full contribution until the book. My grandmother, I knew what she mapped the trajectory. I knew that was important. She did not wear it as a badge of honor. And NASA did not advertise it as a badge of honor. So. She did something great, but maybe there were those who did it something greater, and, and she, that her contribution was, you know, not that 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 large. So it wasn't until the book and the mu movie and and the uh, publicity that um, I found out how she touched the space industry as well as 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 far in, uh, as well as today's airplanes. There's some safety mechanisms in place today that they're still using that she had something to do with uh, putting in place. So it's, it's worldwide that her contribution went. And, and no, it wasn't until mm. of years recent. Mm -hmm. I really feel as though that that was just that was just a really a terrible thing to happen in history that we did not know about Katherine Johnson's contribution. My own parents didn't hear about her until they were well in their mm -hmm. 70s. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's almost a crime of history that her contribution wasn't highlighted sooner. Yes. But let's, let's take a step back and talk about what it was like growing up with such an impactful grandmother. Just watching her in the video, mm -hmm. I could sit and listen to her yes, all day long. Yes, you can. She is very, she's a strong character. Yes. She's just the type of person that has a lot of fortitude. Mm -hmm. Did she encourage you to become involved in science and math? What was it like growing up with her? Growing up was, uh, as I said earlier, was just never a dull moment. And I don't mean that because they were all jokes all the time. Mm -hmm. Her home was filled with uh, so much literature. And I would just close myself into a room where the National Geographic and the encyclopedias. And um, I think I was just born to be in the, the world of biology and a scientist. Um, so she and I bonded through that because there was never a question I could come with her that she would not know the answer. And I was just always amazed that uh, even as a child, if she didn't know, she led me to the answer. And so in your child's mind, you still think that she knows it all because she helped me find the answer. Um, and there was never a topic that was uh, off limits. Um, there was never a time where, you know, child stays in their place. You were always welcomed into anything that was a positive in the household. And as I stated in my bio, culture, she always talked, uh, I've met four sets of my great grandparents. So I was very fortunate that she made sure we had Thanksgivings and if, if we went to one set one year, then we went to the other set for Christmas. And if we went to that set for Christmas, another set for Easter. So um, our culture, where we came from, family stories, the fact that my grandmother says she always counted, 
when we took her to her hometown for her 99th birthday in August this year, there were people on her block who were there when she was a child who went to school with her, but of course she moved ahead. So they were a little younger. Okay, so they weren't all 100-year-old people, but uh, they, were, they were up there, and they were telling stories about, do you remember when your mother was looking for you and you were at the um, <clears throat> schoolhouse helping so-and-so who was like three or four grades higher tutoring with their math? And my grandmother was seven and eight, and they said she would be lost out helping someone else. So she, she, she has still continues that, that um, whether we were gardening or hanging clothes on the line. There was a story, there was a lesson. Um, she didn't get lost in an adult world. You were always brought into the conversation. And to me, she just was like my walking encyclopedia. So we hung and we hung close. Um, so that's, you know, just to say that um, from the house to her, uh, to bridge parties, Pacino parties, her AKA days, the church choir. She was always into something that was motivating, that was positive, and that was always embracing yeah. those around. Um, my grandmother says, um, we don't meet strangers. So uh, just the other day I mentioned someone we hadn't seen in a long time, and she said, I think you should go see about them. You know, we don't meet strangers, and people are truly drawn to her. She still has a, um, I guess he's about 12 now. He comes over from time to time and, and, and he's teaching her Spanish, <laughs> you know. So she looks forward to those days. Um, she's tutored uh, people of all races. I uh, go home now for my holidays and people will see me at the post office or something and say, your grandmother tutored me and if it wasn't for her, I would have never gotten through uh, algebra mm -hmm. and it's because of the movie that they're coming out now but she knew what she was about she knew who she was but her gifts and talents she shared regardless of what we knew back then or not you know one of the things that strikes me about the movie is that growing up in the era that your grandmother grew up I mean I just I can't even imagine what it was like we understand what racism and bigotry is like today but what our grandparents had to deal with was something else. And one of the things that I try to tell my own children is be the best that you can be. If you are the best at what you are, nobody can deny you. Yes. And I think that your grandmother is a wonderful example of that mm -hmm. because she was the best that she could be in her field and they couldn't deny her. Right. What did she share with you about growing up, being an African American woman in, you know, segregationist uh, mm -hmm. America. What did she tell you about fortitude and forging ahead? She reminded me regularly that we're all the same, that no one is, no one is better than you and you are no better than anyone else. And that was what her father told her. And she, to this day, will still remind us. Um, and if you hear that often enough, you will believe it because if you look around the room and we, you know, we're all human and you go into the sciences as I did and you learn about what a human being is, it's just a different color, a different shape, a different size. So my contributions may be different than yours, but yours are no better than mine and mine are no better than yours. As long as we're giving, you're doing something positive. And pretty much um, when my mother moved to Virginia, I was about six years old. We moved into an all white neighborhood. We were the only black family and um, she bought a house and we were not treated very kindly at all for years. We endured uh, a lot just walking out the door to go to school. And my grandmother would pretty much almost, it would not, she would not allow it into the conversation. You didn't you weren't gonna harp on it, you're just gonna keep moving, you're just gonna keep doing what you have to do. And through that fortitude, mm -hmm. the, the damage, or the, the, the problem stopped. They stopped themselves. We did not call the police, we did not fight back, we did not go tell their parents, it just stopped. Because we just kept going. And I believe my brothers and I um, have taken that into our adult lives. 
and it's just through her, um, as you say, fortitude that and her advice. Let they're gonna do them. You you do you. Yeah. You do you. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't with a, a hammer and a gavel. <laughs> it was just her word, and that's what Grandma said. Okay. <laughs> you know, it works for us. Yeah. You know, I have two kids myself. I have a daughter that's going to be heading off to college in a couple of years, and we've started talking about some of the things that she wants to study in college. And I feel a responsibility to make sure that my African-American children follow certain programs. I, I, I mean, sports, great, fine. Mm -hmm. But I feel like science, technology, yes. engineering, math, I feel like if you're good at it, mm -hmm. there's a responsibility to pursue it. Did your grandmother have that type of attitude with you guys too? She had an attitude. She, we knew that science, that STEM was important. Um, and she what did not, she was not very strong on what you're going to do. Her, her last closing words almost to every conversation from the time I can remember as a teenager to now, at the end of the conversation, she says, have fun. So whether I call to say, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to do this, or I'm having a hard day at school today, or call her on the telephone when I was in college, can you help me with this yeah. geometry problem, or uh, out, you know, some, some schoolwork, um, she would say, have fun. So <laughs> she wanted us to, she never did, she never did harp on you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. She wanted you to do where your, where, go where your passion led. And if you, my brothers went in the military, you could just, it was the, just joy. Yeah. It was joy. And when you, pers when you to me, when you uh, pursue something with joy and you're joyous, it's like lifting that person up. If your child wants to go into engineering, she's going to give you all the support you need. If they want to go into the military, they're going to get all the support they need. At one time, I thought I wanted to be a hairdresser. She was one of my best uh, patrons. She came every week. So she, yeah, so she, she was just there for wherever turn you wanted to go. But if you think about the meaning of STEM and the meaning of science, biology is the study of life. So no matter what you do, and I tell my students all the time, no matter what you touch, taste, see, or feel, it has something to do with science. So she pushed you outdoors. We went camping. We went to the amusement parks. Uh, as a 70-year-old grandmother, she was still taking us to the, uh, to the roller coasters. And so she's going to talk about the aerodynamics of it. So she's, uh, you know, so she's still engaging you um, and, and, and laying it out there for you. So she did not stress the stems, but she, pers she, she stressed, as you said, for your children, being the best you can be in whatever area you find yourself. Because again, uh, STEM wasn't a big word for them uh, in her era, but no matter almost what you do, you're going to be in some type of a science, even sports these days. Yeah. I have to say, Hidden Figures was just such an entertaining movie. Besides the message behind it, I feel like it was so well done. Mm -hmm. What was it like when your grandmother found out that a movie was going to be made about her life? She said, me? About me? <laughs> <laughs> about me? She yeah. didn't think it was worthy, that her story would be worthy. Not at all. And until, uh, even when Taraji and Tel Ted Malfi, the producer, came to her home to talk to her, she was still so humbled and couldn't believe that it was going to be able to lead into a movie. And she was just like, what? A movie? Um, I do remember when we went to the White House, and I must say that there was a, a a, com a computer genius that worked for the Obama administration. Her name was Megan. Megan read about my grandmother somehow, some way, and she's the one that put the bug in, in Obama's ear about this woman, Katherine Johnson, and what she had done. So that prompted him to do his research, and she was nominated for the Medal of Freedom. And my grandmother said, well, if I'm going to the White House, my grandchildren are coming with me. 
So all six of us, we're going to the White House, and everyone is like, oh my gosh, no one's ever come in with that many people. No one's ever come in that many people. <laughs> and Michelle and Ms. Uh, President Obama at the time um, just greeted us with open arms. And he said more than once, he said, it's your life story that I'm so honored to know. Uh, in addition to what she did at NASA, I'm telling you that people are, are they're drawn to her for a reason. There's something that she gives back knowingly and, and unknowingly about uh, her conversations or how she touched lives. Um, and where were we coming from? We were talking about just the, just how humble she was. How humble, yes. Movie so Obama her. comes to kiss her the first time and she's Ugh. just poised. And this was before the, the cameras. And she's poised. And when he comes down, the biggest smile comes on her face. She leans her cheek up. And she just, you can see she's taking it all in. So uh, the day, the morning is going on. And um, he, so they leave you and come back. And Barbara Streisand comes over to her and says, Miss Johnson, I'd like you to know that I read the script. And I wanted it, but they gave it to a man. And we we're all like, script. So this was before we knew that uh, Shetterly had sold her books, you know, the script. So that's when we found out. She was like, script. So of course, you know, uh, we move on. So then Obama's come back again, and um, he comes towards her. And you just see her cheek go up. So he comes down for another kiss. And so in her humble mind, she, um, in her humble spirit, should I say, my grandmother is um, still just, her, she's going to say, I'm honored, and I'm proud to be here, and honored. Because she just, as the video says, she feels like she was doing her job on a daily basis. And she always carried herself that if you make a mistake, we don't argue, fuss, and fight. Never heard a, a loud voice come from the house. You fix it, and you make it right, and you move on. If you hurt somebody's feelings, you apologize, you move on. If you, if you mess up on a test, you go back, you ask the teacher for a second chance, you move on. And lessons like that I take into my school life today. Um, but that is her character. It is not about me. It's not about we. It's just about doing what is right. And if we look at some of our, our other models of uh, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, people who we you know, found these great things from, and I'm not saying my grandmother is a saint in any of your worlds, although she is in mine, but I'm saying if you look at people of greatness, lots of times you see that humbleness about them, yeah. that it's, it's not their story they care the most about. It's, it's your story. And, and you know, that's, that's the way I see it with her. I have one more quick question before David opens up the floor to questions. How is your grandmother doing now, 99? If the brain is a muscle that needs mm. to be exercised, I'm guessing that she's pretty sharp. Yes, she's still pretty sharp. If her eyes would keep up with her, uh, she'd be here probably with me today. Um, she's, she, her conversations, our conversations can last anywhere from an hour to two on a weekly basis. Um, she welcomes and she's very uh, open to having her company come. She loves to talk. She will work a word crossword puzzle if you do the writing for her because of the, you know, her eyes, not what it used to be. But up until about three years ago, she was still doing her crossword puzzles. She was reading the paper from front to back. She was still reading her, her nightly reads. Um, she loves the orchestra. She loves gospel music. My grandparents, both of them, were always busy in the mind. Even if you came home from school and you go to visit, they're at the table with a pencil and pen. They're doing something. She had her famous chair with her calculator. And so, uh, you know, you could always hear that da-da-da-da-da in the background where she's running some type of numbers because she was the treasure of this and the treasure of that. So um, we have been led to believe um, that, well, we know the brain is a muscle and that if with any other muscle, that if you use them, you won't lose them. Mm -hmm. And I truly continue to call home and remind her caregivers, um, read to her, talk to her, 
go get someone new, introduce them so that her, so she can continue to be stimulated. And I find that to be the key to her longevity right now is through mental stimulation. Okay. Absolutely. Well, we are gonna open up the floor. Yes, we have a, a few minutes for some questions. So who'd like to ask a question? I'll come back and. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, my name is Charles Clark. I live in Enfield, New Hampshire, but I'm originally from Newport News, the next town from where your grandmother lived. Yes. I mentioned to my cousin, who still lives in Newport News, he's a judge there, uh, and the next thing in the mail, I got a copy of the book <laughs> signed by a lady who's mentioned in the book who met your mother, your grandmother, at the church in Newport News. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, uh, the copy of the book that I got it shows the cast of the movie on the front of the book, yes. not, not the original people. I'm wondering mm -hmm. why. Okay. Mr. Clark, thank you. Um, there are, the, the hardcover book has the original photo, but that is not a photo of my grandmother. It's a photo, the book, the, the original book has, spans a history over almost 20 years of NACA moving into NASA. And the book is a plethora of, of history in a time when Hampton, Virginia and their Langley Field base was moving from moving into the space race, but by way of the war. So I learned myself about their contribution to supplying vehicles to different countries when we, the, our country was in war. So the original book is not necessarily about Katherine Johnson. There are a number of women specifically that that book is about. The second book, uh, the paperback, like maybe they didn't think that it was gonna be so, you know, mm -hmm. sold out and just as big as it was. The second copy, was geared more towards those who are now seeing the movie. And so then they put the, the picture of the, the, the actresses. And then you even have a third book, which is Children's Read, which also has a picture of the actresses. So on neither of them are there any pictures of my grandmother, Dorothy, or Mary. Uh, just happens to be some ladies that um, she found in her history in her pulling out history for the um, book. And thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, my name is Jill Monnett Seabrook. I'm a retired um, educator from Cambridge, Mass. Um, my question is in the, in the movie script um, trailer that we saw yesterday of the film, they definitely made a point that saying that the bathroom um, incident never happened. Um, I am curious, were the bathrooms at that time when she was there segregated? And if so, how far away did she have to go to okay. relieve herself? Um, I asked her specifically, because that's one of the most touching scenes to me, um, you know, floored me the first time I saw it. Well, the bathrooms were segregated when she first started, and the bathroom was not in her building. So I said, well, what did you do? And she said, I didn't go. I said, what do you mean you didn't go? She said, I made a point of not having to go every day. And in my grandmother's mind, I know that that means I was never going to have them see me run, jump, wiggle in my seat. And I think back to the coffee and how they say coffee can sometimes help you to hold. And I thought about, um, because she did have that silver coffee can, uh, coffee pot, the old kind, you know, mm -hmm. and you plug it into the wall, percolator, that's what they called it. And she lived with a percolator near her desk and, of course, went at home. And I just thought to myself, well, maybe um, that was just a way of her being able to hold it. Um, but that's exactly what she told me. She said, I, ju I didn't go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question? Ted Melfi did uh, tell us um, at the red carpet event in New York that a lot of what he put in was for Hollywood, you know, to make it a movie that everybody would want to come and see. And um, he shared a story that 
he was on an airplane flight and he was in, in uh, Europe. And when he got there, Octavia Spencer and another and one of her friends were at a restaurant. And he goes in and they were already seated. He gives them a hello and he says, excuse me, he goes to the restroom. And on his way to the restroom, the waiter said, what would you like to drink? And he told him, when he came back, his drink was at the table. And he said, you ladies aren't, aren't having anything? And she said, no, they haven't asked us. He said that was the point when he knew that this was going to be the movie for him, the script for him, mm -hmm. that million, you know, thousands of miles away and, th and hundreds, and, you know, many years have passed. But the racism, the unfairness mm -hmm. in treatment of people based on the color of their skin is what led him to go on, go on and take this, uh, this script. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I thought that was that meant a lot to me, and the saying the t the character of him and um, his venture, St uh, Kevin Costner, meeting him was one of my oh, <laughs> my highlight moments right there up with Obama and Mrs. Uh, Obama, Kevin Costner. Yes, yes, yes. So Kevin Costner shared that that as well is what made he what he made a point of wanting to be in this movie because when he read the script he felt the same as um, Mr. Melfi that there are too many occasions where racism and the color of a person's skin still determines how they are treated and where they go and how far they can get in this life. He's very passionate about that. Our last question. Oh. Uh, I'm just curious, it sounds like she had a very close relationship, or has, with all of her grandchildren. Yes. How about the first generation, all her, her, her children? Not so much what the relation was, but um, how aware your were mother they? and their, her siblings were of their mother's uh, work, and how much her work influenced. influenced or interfered with being a mother. Okay. Um, I'm glad you asked that. My mother, who is uh, the second child, Connie, my mother has, has passed. It's um, been seven years. My mother and grandmother were, as the neighborhood, as the people at home called, frickin' frack. They were very, very close. So my mother is the only daughter who stayed in the town where my grandmother was and where she grew up. So they were very, extremely close. My mother was my grandmother's biggest cheerleader. My mother went to every event. As I said, I was taken along. Well, my mother went. She was invited. She prompted. She helped her get dressed. She drove her. Um, my mother knew what my grandmother was and how important what she did was. And you could tell that by the way she, she treated her. You couldn't, my mother could not meet anybody on an airplane, a grocery store, nowhere without telling them, by the way, do you know my mother did? <laughs> and it would be like, Mama, you know, stop. These people don't know Grandma. She talked about her all over the place. Um, my grandmother was in a sixth grade science book when I was coming out of high school. Yes, and it's like, um, it was just like, I don't know what school it was, where well, someone sent a book to my mother. And we're like, wow, grandmother's in a, and it was a math book. Grandmom's in a math book. It was one little page, one little corner, but it didn't continue. It never came to our hometown. So my mother was, like I said, they sent the book to her because people only knew Connie, Connie, Connie talked about Catherine, Connie. So there's also an academy, Catherine Johnson um, STEM Academy in, North Carolina. The year my mother passed, they dedicated that, that facility to my grandmother. And since she's passed, the principal and the owners have written to me and said, if it wasn't for your mother, we would have never known what your grandmother has done. And they dedicated that in 2010, which means that was even before Margot's book. So my mother was the talker. She was the talker. Even in the movie, she was the talker. Um, my mother was a teacher. But by far, my grandmother says, if the genius gene went down, then my mother got it. 
and you know, so then there's some other generations. Um, so my mom was, Connie can do it. That's what her business card said. Call Connie, she can do it. Whatever you can think <laughs> of, my mother could do it. She was a very well-loved person, but she was um, a very br a brilliant person. Um, and again, she, she was a teacher. My mother's older sister, Anjoilette, is, uh, well, is retired, but she became an engineer. So she did not do trajectory or work for NASA, but she worked um, in the air, aeronautics industry. <clears throat> um, and she, she really made a name for herself. And so she, that gene, you know, that, that lifestyle carried on for her. And then my mother's younger sister was a teacher and then a um, guidance counselor. And one thing about my grandmother, you will, I, you, I have always been told, she was not the babysitting kind. Mm -hmm. You didn't go to her for the scraped knees or the hurt feelings because she's just gonna tell you, put a Band-Aid on it and move on. And <laughs> I am the same way. I tell all my students, they come to me, I said, drinks. Did you have some water? Go get some water and come back. I have a stomach ache. Go get some water and come back. I felt I have a, go get some water. Um, so I, I got that honestly. Uh, so she wasn't the babysitting grandmother, but if you if she was doing a, a something around the house, or you could say Michelle's gonna come over and help you with such such, bring her on. But it wasn't gonna be uh, fluffy doll babies and teddy bears and watching cartoons. <laughs> Not that kind of person. So I believe that's a little how they influenced, she influenced her children into motherhood. Um, we have always been very tight through love, but it's always been um, through an event, whether it's volunteer, whether it's um, a holiday, or coming together for, like, you, uh, like it said in the bro uh, brochure, through culture, through something that's gonna bond us as a humanity, something that's gonna bond us as a family, as a church family, sorority family, coming together for a purpose. And that's pretty much how I think that she has influenced her children and how they're influencing us as well. Thank you all. It really means a lot to us as a family to know that people are, can still be inspired and are interested in her life. And I do want you to know it is, it, it is not in vain that I say thank you, thank you, thank you, because she does mean the world to me. And I just want to say, you know, she may be your grandmother, but her life has been impactful on mm -hmm. all of us, and mm -hmm. she has really made a difference in this world, and we're so grateful for her. Amen. Thank you Thank for sharing.